Cyber and ASEAN International, and NetApp, who is the uh, uh, proud sponsor of this uh, Theater 3 engagement. I'd like to welcome you to our first session, and this is an overview of the DoD Public Safety Communications Ecosystem Modernization Effort with Joe Wassel, Philip LaPerla from DISA, and Mr. John Marcy, President and CEO of NetMaker Communications. NetApp is pleased to be this theater uh, sponsor, just as DISA is transforming itself into a software-centric, data-first uh, service provider, so NetApp has made that transition itself with a unique capability to be able to unify the multi-cloud environment, moving data and VMs and applications without refactoring into any cloud. Mr. Wassel is the executive for the uh, DISA Cyber Ops uh, Directorate. The Cyber Ops Directorate is responsible for synchronizing and directing, directing the delivery and operation of the agency's enterprise capabilities with over 2,300 personnel at 53 locations in eight countries. Previously, Mr. Wassel directed the DOD CIO C4 Resilience and Mission Assurance Office overseeing the development and risk management decisions and combining knowledge and analytics on critical infrastructure and DOD vulnerability assessments. He also chaired the DOD Public Safety Working Group, leading the Uniform Services Joint Staff, National Guard, and others in FirstNet planning 911 services and communications. He served under four Secretaries of Defense as the Assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Communications and Deputy CIO. As an Air Force officer, he commanded troops during several tours and served as the Chief of Command and Control Operations during Operation Enduring Freedom in Kabul. Mr. Philip LaPerla is Mr. Wasson's Strategic Advisor at DISA. Prior to joining DISA, Mr. LaPerla was Assistant Vice President at SAIC supporting DISA, leading the acquisition, engineering, and implementation of the single largest expansion of global communications in DOD history. A retired Army colonel with 28 years of service in the Signal Corps, he held both command and executive posts in both the Army and with the Joint Staff, including being the J-6 for President George W. Bush's Armed Forces and Army Committee. And Mr. John Marcy brings over 35 years of experience in the telecommunications industry. Starting as an Air Force NCO, he later served multiple telecommunications companies as a network engineer. And 15 years ago, he founded NetMaker Communications, which is a leading telecom company that specializes in voice, wireless, and IoT solutions. Uh, we'll welcome uh, Mr. Wassel to the uh, uh, to the podium, and please join me in welcoming these distinguished panelists. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm just going to kind of set the stage, and I'm going to turn it over to real experts. I do. Uh, Really appreciate you taking the time. There's so many choices uh, here right now. I'm really glad you're sitting here and want to learn and uh, understand and partner with us as the Defense Information Systems Agency tries to get its arms around this magnificent ecosystem as we try and protect the folks inside our fence line. So I'm going to start, if you know me, you know where I'm going to start with big numbers to try and give you some scope and scale of the responsibility that we have and then uh, how are we going to move forward together. We do want to leave time for questions and answers at the end of this as well, so I hope you, you'll, uh, you'll be thinking of your questions. We can use some really good, good questions. So when you think about DOD, I'm hoping to get a little bit of a shocked face. Some of, some of the uh, faces are somewhat familiar to me, but uh, if this is the first time you're really thinking about DOD and public safety, let me scope it. So we've got 6,250 camps, posts, stations, bases, and armories worldwide. That's DOD. Inside those fence lines, we have over 3.25 million people. So if you took those fence lines and combined them into one area, we would push Chicago to be the fourth largest city in America. So that's impressive enough as far as the size is concerned, but that's in almost every country around the world. And um, where we do business can be remote, not only from a communications perspective, 
but also from a medical, fire, uh, EMS, and, and police presence as well. So it's a vast, vast uh, collection of our people that we care about inside those fence lines worldwide. We also, inside those fence lines, have 150,000 fire, police, and EMS professionals. Some are contracted, some are civilian, and some are military uniformed folks, right? So our war fighters, as first responders, inside those fence lines, driving fire trucks, police cars, ambulances, or public works. And then just to add on top of that, the National Guard partners within the United States, and then Fifth Army, the Army of NORTHCOM, we start getting up into the hundreds of thousands of possible first responders in the Department of Defense. So do we care about C2 for public safety? We absolutely do. Do we care that the people inside our fence lines feel as safe on a DOD installation as they do when they're at home? We do. Our challenge? is that as we go to next generation capabilities, like next generation 911, your counties, your municipalities, your states are moving to next generation 911, which is basically an analog to IP conversion in the right direction. And what that is going to afford you is voice, video, texting and other capabilities in a more resilient way to, to reach 911 the way you need to reach 911. We're, we have initial capabilities for texting. We don't have video yet and other uh, services are coming. But what we've got to make sure is that when you're on a DOD installation, as I said earlier, you feel as safe to have the capabilities for that call for help that you have when you are outside that fence line. There's got to be a mission operational parity regardless of where you actually are. The other piece of what we do is in some locations we have a very robust inside the fence line capability and so our capabilities roll outside the installation to go put out fires, response to uh, uh, police activities and in some cases uh, medical for, for example, just one of literally thousands of examples is that Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst actually has first responder responsibilities for um, for the turnpike. I think it's about five or so miles of the turnpike. So if there's an accident on the turnpike or some uh, incident on the turnpike, the first responders, DOD first responders, are the first to get the call and first on the scene. You may recall a train situation uh, that happened, an accident up in Seattle by Joint Base Lewis McCord some years back. The 911 calls went to Joint Base Lewis McCord. They were the first on the scene, and I believe rescued 187 of the 190 folks off that, off that train, and then others showed up. So the last thing I want to say to you as I kind of set the stage is that Sometimes we have needs inside our installations where off-base capabilities roll on and sometimes we roll off, right? But it's fast friendships that happen at the first responder edge site. And communications and a shared sense of situational awareness is absolutely required. So that we, sometimes bullets are flying, sometimes there's hazmat situations, Sometimes you've got a medical condition that actually could be uh, caused by a chem bio situation. This is not a time you want to figure those sorts of things out and not have good comms with your mission partners. So we talk about coalition war fighting with our NATO allies and other allies around the world. In the nation and around the globe, first responder mission partners are more varied and more difficult than even the more established coalition warfighting capabilities we've got. So if the term command and control steers you off a little bit from a public safety perspective, let's do the other suit to you, collaboration and coordination. This information flow that has to happen within DOD and with our mission partners at the edge site where the crisis is, is absolutely critical. I think I promised five to seven minutes. I think I'm getting close. So let me just let me. I'm on a roll, right? Let me. So yeah. So let me just say 
you that there's four pillars that we're going to get into. Next generation 911, next generation public safety wireless, next generation enterprise mass warning and notification, and the public safety internet of things. But our number one focus right now is next generation 911 because that's the epicenter for all of those calls for help. And that's where we're going to start, that's where we're going to focus, and that's our main thrust right now. We're lucky enough now at DISA to have an Office of Public Safety Communications, of which Mr. O'Perla is the first director of the Office of Public Safety Comms for the Department of Defense. Just that alone is a milestone for the department that is still working very hard to embrace all the roles and responsibilities we have across the public safety uh, ecosystem. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil. I think you're taking this next. Yes. And thank you again. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. And we'll be here today and tomorrow uh, if you don't have time for this. So thank you very much for being here. Let's move on to the next. As you can see, I uh, kind of lost my bet on how long Mr. Russell was going to be involved. That's all. Uh, John won, I lost, uh, because I, I thought he was going to be very crisp and precise. But he has a passion for, for working this ecosystem. And DISA has taken on that passion to uh, disclaimer. Okay. Everybody read the disclaimer? Good to go. <laughs> So the main crux of what we do with DISA, we have taken on uh, the mission of being the architect for the 911 ecosystem. So as that architect, uh, we have established uh, the road, the on-ramps and the off-ramps to this ecosystem, and taking into consideration to ensure that we reduce the time that it takes a first responder to get on site and to ensure once they're there, the mission commander has the information that they need to execute that mission. So, in this world that we exist in now with our 220 uh, PSAPs, we find ourselves that we are living in an analog environment. I remember as a young signal officer when I learned about open wire communications and vacuum tubes. So in the public safety realm, we're akin to that. We're still in TDM multiplexing. We're still analog. Where our mission partners at the state and municipal levels, we're all going IP. And if we don't make that transition to IP, we're going to be lost. That vital link that we have between them and us, and as Mr. Wassel said, sometimes we're the lead first responders. And if they can't get to us, then there's no hope. So we have to ensure that we eliminate that major problem of being left behind in the digital dust and move to IP. To do that, we've established four main pillars to our house. I'll let you uh, take a look at those uh, as we go along. This is a build slide, I think. No, nope, it's not. <laughs> so uh, it lost the information on the top of the pillars. It's very, yeah, you can't, can you guys see it? No, okay. Well, the first uh, pillar is uh, we're looking uh, for uh, next generation 911. So those are all the things that it takes to ensure that we can move into uh, that realm. And right now, currently, we have uh, buildings with building numbers on them. We don't have street addresses. Sorry, I'm Italian. I can't do the kind of things without the hands and things like that. So we we have building numbers. Uh, we don't have, we have building numbers without street addresses, and you can't 
enter a building number into a geolocationing system and expect a fire truck to know where that is and pull up. So the department has to make a big investment in getting us uh, location-based and into a computer system and not a spreadsheet or flip cards. So when the PSAP operator gets a call, they pick open a flip sheet and look how to uh, send the first responders to the site. So not great. So this main pillar is getting us that way. Uh, you'll see in subsequent slides that Mr. Marcy uh, will talk about that there is a lot that is involved in that. We have gateways that we have to put uh, in place before we actually get to the uh, ability to be next generation 911 capable. The second uh, pillar is uh, the, the guys at uh, command and control at the incident spot. That involves handheld radios. That involves first net. That involves many things that uh, in some instances, maybe even HF in a disaster zone, that require that linking into a system that currently is just analog based and there wouldn't be any linkage, any communications, no transfer of information down those pipes without the next pillar, Internet of Things. Uh, going back again to uh, my Army days, I was buttonholed by my two-star and said, La Perla, I want you to go to Fort AP Hill and we have problems with the ammo dumps. The twisted copper wire is not reporting back to the police station. Go fix it. Well, those twisted copper wires are still there. So what we need to do is, you know, leave, you know, the cable wire daddy realm and, you know, do something with 5G that, you know, will the alarms will get to and get to the PSAT to alert folks that something is going wrong. And the last pillar is letting people know when there's a problem. Big voice, enterprise mass warning notification. Army's got this role, they are the EA, but it is an inclusive part of what we're doing in this program. I'll now turn it on.
the address they're given is the front gate of the base. That's where the first responder shows up. And then he's on his own to try to figure out where the source of the call is. So with NextGen 911, it introduces a whole new realm of possibilities when we can actually integrate GIS data with the VoIP call itself into the SIP header. This is going to get pretty fascinating pretty quickly because now I can introduce the art of policy engines for routing those calls. And that's what the basis of enterprise safety IP networks, ISNets, are that are used in the commercial space. So we're taking all of that into uh, this realm, putting an architecture together, because it's one thing to make this work in the municipal spaces out there with the civilian life, but getting it to work behind the wire inside a DOD network adds a lot more complexity. Now we're into a whole cybersecurity discussion, with zero trust architectures, and all this other good stuff that the civilian side of the house doesn't have to deal with. So it adds a little bit more complexity, but we're up for the challenge. And we're going to share with you this week and during our symposium some of these architectures we've put forward uh, for the DOD's consideration. So the next piece of the pillar is the wireless side. So typically in the public safety realm, when someone talks about wireless, they're thinking landline or radio, LMR. But it's not LMR, just LMR anymore. With the advent of LTE networks, FirstNet, the FirstNet Authority, we've got another band, another radio option that you've probably seen advertised on your television. You can't go a day without seeing an advertisement about FirstNet. And there are other competing networks emerging with other carriers to basically take on the same mission, which is to provide the first responder with an LTE-enabled smartphone tool to perform their mission, to augment their legacy LMR radio that they're accustomed to using. So at this point, we're looking at the convergence of these technologies. How can I make use of an updated LMR environment meeting the P25 security and interoperability standards that have been laid out by CISA in conjunction with the commercial LTE space that's coming online with this private LTE network we know as FirstNet. Add to the complexity of the challenge, we're also looking at other RF communications. We heard talked a minute ago about the possibility of HF but we also are looking at VHF load spectrum. So if I'm out in the back 40 uh, training range, that first responder needs to go out beyond the range of the LMR, that they don't lose connectivity with the PSAC. They don't lose connectivity with the person who's in the help. So we're really looking at expanding the wireless to the next generation which is a federated, seamless environment where we can take the advantage of the existing LMR technology as it moves to an IP space, federating it with this new LTE space and gatewaying to other possible RF spectrums to provide one large radio net for the future first responder. This one is still scratching the surface. So, as Phil mentioned, it's not uncommon today to see today's alarm environment. When I'm looking at physical security alarms, more importantly, fire alarms, a lot of those are on old analog systems. They're tied to dial-up lines. Uh, I've got weapon depots where if the door goes ajar, it's going to dial up a circuit to get to a management console somewhere. Still using the TDM end offices as its primary source of communications. Some bases have gone out and actually established private wireless point-to-point -point networks to support the comms of these old analog lines. Commercially, that technology is going away. If you go into the commercial side, all of that technology has moved IP gave birth to what we call Internet of Things. So taking the DoD from this old 40-year-old 
ecosystem to a true emerging IoT environment. It's going to be like trying to turn an aircraft here. Uh, it's going to be a pretty daunting task. And there are literally millions of security panels out there in the environment that will all need to be identified and addressed. And the challenge for the department is there is no single command that has eyeballs on every single asset in this space. Some of these were installed by the tenant owner of the building and nobody else knows about it. So how do I take that and actually federate that into an Internet of Things solution? And then when I look at the comms aspect of it, we're really targeting 5G, the emergence of the private 5G capability, as a mechanism to start meshing and networking some of this new IoT capability sets uh, into this ecosystem. So brand new stuff, just again at the scratching stage of this, this requirement is written into this DODD 8422 that's in the process of being signed out at the this place. Yep. Is that illegal? We're, we're up to the to the boss's desk. So once that's signed out, this requirement is inked into that directive requiring the department to transition off of this legacy analog alarm environment into this new IoT space. Okay, so this pillar is emergency mass warning notification. So the CIO assigned the Army as the executive agent to represent the Department of Defense as a whole in this environment. If you're not familiar with this technology, this is the mass warning system. So if there was an active shooter, the ability to reach your cell phones and your desktops and any other communications medium we can latch on to to tell you to go shelter in place. That's what a mass warning notification system is. The DOD has two active systems pretty popular out there today, and this task is to federate those into a single enterprise capability to support the entire Department of Defense so we don't have little ecosystems of capabilities that aren't in our the Army has the lead on this. They are in the process of getting the selected and approved uh, requirements adjudicated and submitted through their Army Requirements Oversight Council. I believe that is probably just weeks away of getting that in front of the AROM. Once that is signed out, then this capability will be in the queue for uh, money to actually start getting money programmed against it. This is my commercial. So I talked about the symposium that we're hosting this week. It kicks off this afternoon at 1300. Mr. Wassel will be providing our welcoming remarks. Uh, it is upstairs in room 337. And today we have a speaker uh, from NASDA coming in. We've got also Kate Elkins coming in to speak. I believe Harriet is not going to make it today, so I'll probably provide the. Uh, ah, okay, got it. Um, I'll probably take my architecture overview and brief it this afternoon and let her fill in for my space tomorrow. But tomorrow is the full day. We've got a jam packed day with a lot of good conversations that I encourage you all to sit in on. Uh, we'll be talking about the uh, interim uh, operational capability target of taking our current PSAPs, getting them in a position to work with state easy nets until we get the uh, platforms upgraded to IP. We'll share what the long range plans are. Uh, I've got Mr. Thomas here tomorrow who will be talking about the cybersecurity angle of public safety and what mechanisms we're putting in place to protect uh, the 911 call flows. Uh, and then we've got David Firth from the FCC that will be here tomorrow to talk about laws and regulation updates as it pertains to the new 988 uh, 
uh, requirements. I don't know if you're familiar with 988, but this is a new dialing sequence that is being implemented nationwide to get a caller in touch with a suicide hotline number uh, specifically. So instead of 911, you dial 988, and it's going to get you in touch with someone to help you out. We, the DOD, are in the process now, just sort of implemented a directive to the department to get all of our legacy TVM end offices programmed to support 988 dialing. And our current VoIP enterprise has already been programmed to support 988 dialing. So if you dial 988 on a DOD phone, you're going to get put in touch with the Veterans Administration a suicide hotline. So that's work we've been doing in the background. We'll hear more about that tomorrow. And then day three, uh, a lot of focus there will be on the wireless side. So we've got Mr. McNeely, who will be uh, chairing a panel with uh, Army and Air Force participation uh, and Marine Corps participation uh, that will be talking exclusively about our LMR uh, update and enterprise strategy. Uh, and then in addition to that, we've got Mr. Brennan, who's going to give a talk about GIS. How are we implementing GIS in Next Gen 911? Because we're going to get off of Legacy Alley. I don't care about street addresses anymore when I get to Next Gen 911. What I care about is that lat long quarter. So that X, Y, and eventually Z. Because at some point, I want to be able to pinpoint if a caller is calling from the sixth floor of an office building. And I can do that with GIS data uh, through voice over IP. So with that, that is what's on tap for the next few days. That's my commercial. I encourage you all to participate if you want to learn more about any of these particular tracks. And thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it over back to you, Joe. Folks, I just want to put, put this in perspective for you that eight years ago last month, we had the very first public safety communications working group in the DOD CIO's office, um, and I was there, and some of you were there as well, but boy has the community grown. Our ability to understand our needs and our requirements has gotten more specific down to the detail that we can actually have an adult conversation with you. And your understanding of us has grown over time as well. I want to put just a, a, a put it in perspective that the story we told at the very first meeting eight years ago was about the Yardell Canyon fire where we lost 18 firefighters. I don't know any, I don't know much more about Western wildfires today than I did then, but I do know one thing. If you're in a burned out area, it can't burn again. And those 19 firefighters were in a burned out area and something compelled them to move to an area and put them at great risk. Just so you know, communications actually were working. There were no LMR issues. The problem was operational, situational awareness. What had burned, what had not burned, the weather and the wind, and the location of the area where the, the firefighters were trying to get to that were they, they were unable to get there. So I want to leave you with a challenge that just getting through the pillars, just making a good 911 call, just having a phone that will work to, to reach out is not going to be good enough for us moving forward. It's not good enough for the people that we care about inside our fence lines and out, and it's not good enough for our first responders. So I want to raise the bar and let you know that we are not satisfied with the current state of situation. But we are very excited to tell you more about who we are in the department and how we can partner to move forward to modernize public safety communications for the protection of our people and our first responders and as we interoperate with our mission partners. So I just want to say thank you very, very much. I took a picture of you because we've had some really humble crowds over the years, but it's growing, and we're growing, and our understanding is growing, and that's good for the people that we care about and our first responders. So thank you very, very much for being here this morning. I want to thank my panelists, Phil and John. Thank you very much, part of the work family. Really appreciate you being here as well. We're happy to take any questions uh, at the microphone if you've got any.
Uh, if not, we can uh, we can take it from there. I hope you'll visit the symposium. We'll be around to answer your questions. But if we've got any questions, we'll take them. Or I'll give you a little bit of time back. Have a good, safe... Uh